Family Theater presents Jean Crane and Robert Stack. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Today is Sunday, starring Robert Stack. And now, here is your hostess, Jean Crane. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Today is Sunday, starring Robert Stack as Joe. I finished the medical report and got up and went over to the window. I could see all the way down the main street through the big elm trees to where the red light at Morton and Highway 14 blinked and blinked in the quiet summer darkness. When I first heard the noise, I thought it might have been one of the comedians from the resort crowd at White Lake driving his girlfriend home in a souped-up two-seater. It was old stuff. They'd roar through Gentryville and he'd start snapping the ignition off and on and the explosions were supposed to wake up all the hicks. They never did, but the White Lake boys kept right on trying. I leaned out the window, waiting for a breeze that wasn't there. The explosions were about ten minutes old now, but no car had come by from either direction. I turned away and went back to my desk and glanced at the medical report for the insurance company. Everybody thinks the only doctor in a small town has got it made. Well, everybody should try it sometime. Yes? Dr. Fry? That's right. They, uh, a friend of mine's been hurt. I'd like you to take care of him. Uh, sure. Where is he? Hal? Yeah? Bring him up. Uh, what's wrong with your friend? He got shot. I helped him get the man into my office and down on a couch. He was about 25 with a slight build and short blonde hair. The bullet was lodged in his upper arm that had shattered the bone. When that happens, there's usually a lot of picking and probing to do, although the slug itself isn't very hard to find. Good man, Doc. Is he going to be all right? Well, there uh, may still be a few bone splinters left, but he hasn't lost too much blood. So how long are you going to be out like this? The anesthetic ought to wear off in about 20 minutes. I think you better tell me how it happened. Well, it was an accident. He was cleaning his gun out. Hunting rifle. It must be quite a rifle. How do you mean, Doc? It shoots 38 revolver bullets. You stay where you are, Doc. They know I'm here. Who's they? Everybody in town. I live upstairs. That phone got an extension? Out there, in the hall. Hal, get over in the doorway. Okay. When I nod, you tell the doc to answer it in here. You bet. All right, Doc, pick it up. No funny stuff. Hello? Joe? Hello, Julie. Joe, Uncle Vic's been hurt down at the bank. How do you mean, honey? Three men broke in and robbed it, and one of them shot him. Oh, Joe, you've got to come right away. Hold the wire a second. What do I do? Keep your hand over the phone. Ask her how bad he's hurt. Hello, honey? Joe, what's wrong? I thought it was someone at the door. It's all right. Is Vic wounded very badly? He's been shot in the leg, but I don't know how bad it is. Joe, you've got to... I'll be to... right over, honey. Don't move him. You better let me go. I'm the only doctor around here, and if I don't get to him in time, he might bleed to death, and it'd be murder on top of armed robbery. Who is the girl? She works in the sheriff's substation. Her uncle's a night watchman at the bank. Yeah? What's she to you? Not a thing. Not a thing. You called her honey. You go around calling everybody honey? All right, we're engaged. Look, if I don't get over there pretty soon, it's... You'll a... go when I'm ready. Here. I can't take money from you. Take it, a thousand bucks. Look, I told you... You're I... going to earn it. Now you listen. 
That guy who got plugged is probably going to be fine. If I get to him in You'll time... get to him. Being your girl's uncle, I take it you know him. Of course. All right. You give him half of this, 500. And tell him it's for keeping quiet in case he recognized anyone. Same as your half. You're crazy. Outside of the rough stuff, the only one who gets hurt in a bank robbery is the insurance company. You keep quiet and it'll stay like that. I say we ought to take care of this guy right now. And leave the night watchman to do a lot of talking before he blinks out? How do we know he will blink out? Because this is the only doc in town. And he needs one. Any more questions? Yeah. What's to keep this guy from spilling after we leave? The girl. What are you talking about? Look, Doc. We know you've got one. And we know who she is. So if you or the Uncle Peep just once, she gets in trouble. Big trouble. I'll give Hal a hand with a kid. We'll take him out the back. By the time I got down to the bank, they'd brought Vic into the beauty shop next door and had him laid out on one of the massage tables. There was a pretty good crowd to start with, but gradually Julie and a tall, hard-looking man named Crowley emptied them out into the street. Vic's wound didn't look serious, so I had Julie phone over to the hospital at Edgemont for an ambulance while I went to work patching him up. Crowley just stood there and watched. I didn't know much about him, except that he worked in the sheriff's office. Uh, feel like talking, Vic? Sure. Sure I do. If the doc doesn't mind. It's all right. Just don't tire him out. Did you get a good look at any of them, Vic? Only one. The other two had masks. I guess he had a mask, too, but must have taken it off to work on the vault. What'd he look like? Well, he was pretty big. Can you bring your knee up a little, Vic? Oh, sure. Oh, just hold it like that for a second. There, there. You can let it down now. Thanks. Boy. You say he was pretty big. Yeah. Yeah, he... Crowley, can you let the questions wait a little while? He's still in shock. All right, but while we stand here, they're getting away. Well, I take it you put out an alarm. Three men, one wounded. <laughs> I, I winged one of them, all right. We still don't know what kind of car they were using. Well, it was a dark sedan. That's all I could tell. Could have been black or green or anything. You didn't see the license? Nope. Don't even know it was from this state. It... Lieutenant Crowley. Yeah? There's a call for you up at the office. It's the sheriff. Where is he? Williamsburg. You'd better come along and take it down. It's probably orders. I'll be right with you. How, how's he doing, honey? Just fine. <laughs> I'll be okay, Julie. You know, they blame near missed me. You just lie there and keep quiet. I'll be right back, Joe. Swell. Incidentally, the ambulance is on its way. Say, uh... Vic. Yeah, Doc. You, um, you want a cigarette? Sure. Here. Thanks. Uh, Vic, the man you saw without his mask, you think you'd know him if you saw him again? Hmm. I think so. He was big, had a real long... Funny-looking face. Well, do you think you'd know him from a picture? Maybe. Why? Well, that's probably all you'll get to identify him by, police photos. I... I think I'd know him. Odd-looking gent. Vic, I... Vic, I've got to tell you something that happened tonight. It's going to sound pretty crazy, but it's true. And I want you to have the whole story before Crowley gets back. Then we can both think it over for a day or so and then decide what to do. The ambulance arrived from Edgemont about 20 minutes later, and two attendants came in with a stretcher and carried Vic out. As they loaded him into the back, Crowley was still trying to get a description of the man who opened the vault. But all Vic could remember was that he was kind of tall and seemed to have dark hair. A few minutes later, the ambulance pulled away and I drove Julie home. About 8 o'clock the next morning, I was making coffee in the hot plate in my office when Crowley turned up. Feels like it's going to be a scorcher today, huh? Yeah. Have a cup? No, thanks. Just finished breakfast. 
Well, what can I do for you, Lieutenant? I won't take much of your time, Doctor. I guess you're pretty busy at this hour. Usually, but things seem to be kind of quiet this morning. Don't worry, it won't be long. Before what? The phone starts ringing. Little Millie's got the colic. Johnny tried to swallow the thrashing machine. You don't like it much, do you, being a small-town doctor? Not too much. You like being a small-town cop? Well, it beats working. This way you usually take most of your calls? Yes, why? I thought maybe we woke you up last night. Uh, I was right here in the office filling out a medical report and a man I examined for insurance. Is that kind of a sideline with you? Sideline? It accounts for about 30% of my income. Yeah, I guess every little bit helps. Where's the other phone, Doc? What? Your line's been out of order since 1.20 this morning, just about the time I had Julie call you. Well, the other phone's out in the vestibule. Well, here, I'll show you. Off the hook? Yeah, I wonder how that happened. Well, here, I'll... Don't touch it, Doc. Allow me. Uh, what's the handkerchief for? Fingerprints. What are you getting at? You, maybe. I think you're in trouble. Me? According to four witnesses who heard the sounds of the shots, and I'm one of them, the men who robbed the Gentryville Savings and Loan pulled away from it in a car a little before one this morning. One of the men was wounded. We found stains on the pavement, so he needed a doctor right away. Look, if you're trying to implicate me... You're the only doctor in town. Oh, so they must have driven out of town. Then, 15 minutes later, you receive a phone call here to come over and take care of Vic. And you say you took it in your office, not on this instrument. All right, Mo. Maybe I did take the call out here. I'm not sure. You got up from your desk in the office, which has a phone on it, and walked out here to the vestibule to take the call? Look, I'm telling you I took the call out here. I'm not sure if I was coming out of the office or headed upstairs or what. And then when you were finished, you didn't hang up. You just laid the receiver down here on the table like you always I was do. excited. Maybe I knocked the thing off without knowing it. Do you know where you really stubbed your toe, Doc? Look, I don't even know what you're talking about. When you told me in the beauty parlor that I shouldn't have any trouble tracing the robbers because one of them was wounded. You just said there were stains on the sidewalk. You didn't know that. And Julie didn't say a word about it over the phone because I was there when she called you. Well, she told me when I drove up in the car. Did she tell you there were the same kind of stains on your front porch? Your practice doesn't bring in a lot of money, does it, Doc? I make a living. You keep much cash on hand here? About $50. Small bills, I suppose. Singles, five? Yes, mostly. Mind if I have a look around to see if you've got anything larger? You have a search warrant? I can get one. You come back when you've got it. I'll have to state that I need it because you were unwilling to cooperate. You go right ahead and state it. I'll get it. Oh, you're a great man with that handkerchief. Hello. Joe? Uh, just a minute, Julie. You take it in the office, Doc. I don't want these prints smeared. Hello? Joe? Yeah, honey. Was that Lieutenant Crowley who answered the phone? Yes, he, uh, he just stopped by. <laughs> Joe, a doctor just called me from the hospital in Edgemont. He said Uncle Vic had a pretty bad night, and he thinks we'd better come over there. He say what was wrong? Just that there'd been some complications. He didn't say what they were. Are you at the office now? Yes. Stay there. I'll pick you up in five minutes. All right, Joe. Crowley, I'm afraid we'll have to postpone our little chat. I know. I'll ride over to Edgemont with you. Suit yourself. But I don't like people listening into my private phone conversations. That's funny. What? I should think you'd be getting used to it. It was a little after nine o'clock when we got to the hospital at Edgemont. And two hours later, Vic was dead. It was a combination of things. Things like a poor heart and sclerotic arteries and a general failure to respond to treatment. But the main thing, of course, was the bullet. He might have lived another 20 years if that hadn't come along. Can I get you anything, honey? No. No, thanks, Joe. Cigarette? 
I don't think so. Why is Lieutenant Crowley still in there? He's got to make the arrangements about getting the certificate signed. Oh, I hope they catch them. I hope they catch I them. I know, honey, I know. Take it easy. Thanks again, Dr. Carter. I'll be in touch with you. I'm awfully sorry, Julie. Thanks, Lieutenant. Incidentally, Carter says it wasn't anybody's fault. He just wasn't strong enough. What do you mean it wasn't anybody's fault? I just wanted to put your mind at rest, Doc. You were a um, little slow getting over to the bank last night. I came as quickly as I could. Yeah, I know. Carter says you did a fine job. The extra five minutes wouldn't have made any difference. I could have told you that. Hmm. There's something else I wish you could tell me. What's that? Who pulled the trigger on him? Most of that afternoon went into making the funeral arrangements, notifying a few of Vic's relatives who lived upstate and talking to a reporter for the Edgemont Banner. The story made the early editions along with a statement by the sheriff phoned in from Williamsburg that his men would be on 24-hour duty until the killers were apprehended. It was after 6 o'clock when we got back to Gentryville. Nobody talked much on the ride home. I dropped Julie at the house, Crowley at his office, and then I turned onto Morton Street and drove toward my place. It had started to cool off, but the sun was still bright and I was driving west. That's probably why I didn't see the convertible parked out in front till I almost banged into it. The top was up and there was a woman seated behind the wheel. A good-looking woman. Dr. Fry? Yes? Could I speak to you for a moment, please? What can I do for you? The friend of a former patient of yours asked me to get in touch with you. Which patient is that? The man you took care of in your office last night. The man who was hurt. I didn't take care of anyone in my office last night. You must have the wrong doctor. My friend paid you $1,000. I don't know a thing about it. You think I'm with the police, don't you? And the $1,000 is just a good guess? Well, it's a nice round number. My friend gave you a $500 bill, three 100s, and four 50s. Does that sound like a guess? What do you want? My friend would like the 1000 back in exchange for this. 1200 in small bills. Lots easier to spend. Not so many questions. Someone else was supposed to get half of that 1000 Did you give it to him? No, I didn't have to. He didn't see anything that was worth $500 to forget. And you'll have all this to yourself. Have you got the thousand with you? No, I'll uh, have to get it. I can wait. It's not in the house. I hid it. Come back around 11 o'clock tonight. I'll have it for you. Now, wait a minute. I've got my own neck to think about, lady. I don't want to stick it out any more than your friend does. That wasn't a bluff, what he told you about the girl. I never thought it was. She doesn't know anything about it? You think I'm crazy? That was her uncle who got killed. My friend isn't going to like this. Well, he can't like it much less than I do. But I've got to go on living in this town. You'll have the money here at 11. I'll be in my office. It's on the first floor. You go in and... Don't worry. He knows where it is. I watched the convertible drive off and then went up the steps to the house. The money was where I'd left it, rolled up and stuffed into a half package of cigarettes in the top drawer of my desk. I flattened the bills out in front of me. It was just a chance, and the way things were shaping up, not a very good one. But my friend with a long face was worried. He didn't want me to be walking around with money like this. He wouldn't even want me to be found dead with it. Lieutenant? Oh, come on in, Doc. That's about to close up shop. Yeah. Really been a scorcher, huh? Yeah. Had dinner in? Uh, no, I wanted to ask you something. Shoot. Do you have any ideas about who those men who killed Vic might be? No, but I do have an idea who might be able to help me. Well, I know all about that idea. Have you got any others? A couple. They're a little vague. You think they might be the kind of men who pulled robberies like this before? No doubt about it. Like where? Well, I was just looking over this dodger that came in yesterday. 
bank hold up in Michigan two days ago, three men. Another in Indiana last week. They killed a bank guard in Indiana. What would it take to convict them for that? The killing? Oh, any number of things. Eyewitnesses, ballistics test on the murder weapon. Well, how about the serial numbers of the bills they stole from the bank? Which bank? Say the one in Indiana where the guard was killed. They'd do pretty good. The, uh... Bills themselves would be even better. Yeah, but the serial numbers would do. Yeah, I'd say so. I suppose you'd have to contact the bank to check the numbers on the bills. Yes, but even so, if somebody knew them... Well, it wouldn't do any good to day-to-day -day Sunday. The banks are closed. Uh, that's right. You but... look in your mail tomorrow morning, Lieutenant. I think you'll find something. Good night. It was about 8.30 when I got home. After I mailed the letter, I had a sandwich down at the drugstore and walked around for a while before going back to the house. I thought about calling Julie, but I ruled it out. It's funny the way you find out how much you love someone. I'd do anything in the world for you, honey. I must have said that to her a dozen times without knowing I really meant it. The office was like an oven. I'd forgotten to open the windows. I sat there for a long time in the dark, smoking, listening to the clock on my desk. Hello? Dr. Fry. Speaking. This is Mrs. Bradley, doctor. Millie's had another attack. Her stomach's aching something awful. Well, do you have any of that medicine left I gave you? Just about a spoonful. Give it to her. If that's not enough, call Wilson at the pharmacy and tell him I said he could refill a prescription. If there's any question about it, he can reach me here. She's aching pretty bad, doc. Well, the medicine ought to fix it. If it doesn't, give me a call. You gonna be in your office another hour or so? Yes. Maybe not quite that long. Okay, doc. Thanks. Not at all, Mrs. Bradley. Not at all. Hello, Doc. Hello. Come on in. You, uh, got the thousand I gave you? In the office here. There's just one thing I'd like to get straight. Sure. The night watchman's dead, so nobody's in on this but me. That's right. Yeah, but how do you stand elsewhere? Let me worry about that, will you, Doc? I figured you worried enough already, but in case you get nabbed for something else, I don't want you to come back here and make trouble for my girl. Don't worry. Because whatever happens to you, it won't be my fault. I know it won't, Doc. Now, uh, where's a thousand? Right here. Good man. Here, here's your twelve hundred. <laughs> Lots of paper, huh? Yeah. Look, you don't have to trust me. Take it over there under the lamp and count it. I trust you. Take it over under the lamp. I guess you must know I figured on this. Get over there. But Julie's not in on it, so when you pull that trigger, it can stop here, all right? It stops when I say so. Put the money in your pocket. Yeah, but she doesn't know a thing about this. They never do. That's something I make sure of. Don't move, Long Face. What? Don't move. Or you'll be all through moving forever. Get him up. Crowley, is that you? Yeah. I shouldn't listen to private phone calls or peek through windows. But in the long run, it pays. You take that muscle's gun and walk him outside. I've got a friend of yours with me. She wants to talk to you. They got all of them? Three men and the girl. Joe. How'd Crowley get my letter? He fished it out of the box in front of the drugstore with a piece of chewing gum on a stick. And on top of everything else, he robs the mails. Joe. I suppose he figures that's all right because it was addressed to him. I suppose so. How'd he get so smart? He could have been barking up the wrong tree all along. He, he talked to Uncle Vic this morning in the hospital while you and I were out having coffee. Oh. Joe. Joe, you were willing to give up your life to save mine. Oh, that's a great exaggeration. You were, Joe. 
Lieutenant Crowley told me how it was. Uh, Lieutenant Crowley is a dumb flatfoot with... Yeah. Is, is that your phone? Yeah, it's probably Mrs. Bradley again. Who? Well, she's got a kid with a colic. I'd better get it. You're going to have to get used to this for a long time. I am? Phone calls late at night, people with a stomach ache who haven't got sense enough to take bicarbonate of soda. I hope so, Joe. What? I hope I'm going to get used to it for the rest of my life. This is Jean Crane again. In speaking of family prayer, which is frankly family theater's purpose and only purpose, a great deal of stress is laid on the children. We visualize a family as composed of father, mother, children, or father, mother, child. Well, it is true that children are the completion, basic object, and normal triumph of family life. But there are also couples who, through no fault or selfishness or timidity of their own, just aren't blessed with children. And yet, they are a family. It may be just a family of two. And they became a family the minute they left the altar and plighted themselves to each other for life. To these, no less than to families in which there are children, Family Theater recommends family prayer. For these, too, have needs and souls and emotions and aspirations that are out of this world. And rightly so. In the full bloom of youth, as newly married folks, they will derive, as Family Theater knows, the great joy of making their love singular and special, and of realizing that true marriage is not a matter of two parties, but of three, and the third is God. While in the autumn of life, knowing as they must that one will precede the other, and one will be left for a short time alone, there need be no sadness or melancholy or panic if they have lived or even started to live a marriage of which the third partner has a share. For then one will not be left alone. It's so easy. It's so true. It's simply this. The family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Today is Sunday, starring Robert Stack. Gene Crane was your hostess. Others in our cast were Paul Fries, Vic Perrin, Gloria Grant, Herb Butterfield, and Vivi Janis. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present Horse Sense, starring Jack Carson. Rod O'Connor will be your host. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America.